SMMEs. There could be potentially 55,000 SMMEs who do not survive the pandemic. Of the 11% that do not see their businesses surviving, 77% of them would, 77 of them employ between one to 10 employees. This means that at least 42,350 people working for these SMMEs will lose their job. And at most, 423,500 people working for these SMEs could lose their job as a direct result of COVID-19. With all this, we must thank the South African government, private and public sector stakeholders for their proactiveness. The DTI, the Treasury, the Department of Small Business Development, and many other stakeholders that is working towards ensuring that we protect our economy, protect our health system, our social system during this pandemic. I believe we'll all get through this. Before we engage our panel members, just some house rules. All the attendees are all muted. Please, you are welcome to adding questions on the Q&A button and feel free to direct the questions to specific panel members. Through the Q&A also, you're also welcome to share what do you expect from the discussions today. We'll also be running some polls, so please feel free to participate in those polls and we'll share the results at a later stage. As you all know, this is a virtual session so if you have your kids crying or running around, please feel free to go attend to them. You don't have to take any permission from anyone. You can go do your thing and come back. If there are any of your friends trying to join this panel discussion and they are unable to do so because the room is full, please, they can, uh, we are also broadcasting this on our YouTube channel. Please, they can use the link for the YouTube channel for this if the Zoom link is, is fully occupied. Finally, I want to apologize to all of you for having an all-male panel. This is not how we roll at 22 on Sloan. And, and the proof is that 60% of our employees are female. So this is just unprecedented also. Marie, who is the head of World Bank in South Africa, got pulled into a last meeting with the Washington team with the managing director in Washington at World Bank. Um, but her colleague, who is Hanesh Rasagam, who is the second in command and the lead private sector specialist, will be representing her. In light of this, I will ensure that we accept more questions from ladies, from females. And, um, and also during the discussions, I might rope in one or two ladies to add their voices to this. Please allow me to welcome our panelists. I will start with Dr. Padli Lehota, the former statistician general of South Africa, whom you all know. The second, is, the second panel member is Sandile Zungu, a businessman, but also the president of Black Business Council. The third person is Karnesh Rasagam, the lead private sector specialist at the World Bank representing Marie-Francois Marie Nelly, the SA country director of World Bank, who couldn't join us today. The fourth panel member is Tahir Musa, who is the co-founder of Analytical Technologies. It's a startup company that is also based at 22 on Sloan. And then the fifth person, the last but not the least, is Advocate Nto Tumulu, President of South Africa Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Welcome to all of you. Thank you very much. So, I'll start with you. Doc, you've been, you've been, uh, uh, Statistician General, you were in that post for the past 15, 18 years or so. You correct me if I'm wrong. And during your time as Stats SA, you could have never predicted what we are facing now, these unprecedented times that we're living in. In your view, why are we in this current scenario? What brought about this current scenario? And before you answer that, Please kindly introduce yourself to the participant, to the attendees, and then answer the question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Kizo. Uh, 
my introduction could be very long if you want to invite me to this because I'm part of 22 on Sloan. Uh, when I left office in 2017, you kindly said, can you come and work with us here? Yeah. I'm Padilo Otra, the former statistician general of South Africa, having occupied that space for 17 years. Uh, I left, you know, end of October uh, 2017, and I've been in the space for 34 years. Uh, yes, indeed, even with the 34 years, you couldn't predict uh, coronavirus. Uh, but one can talk to it as an element of fate. And uh, I want to go back to Nelson Mandela, uh, who said significant progress is possible if only we ourselves plan in the detail, such that when elements of fate emerge, they are on our own terms. Uh, little did we hear what Mariba said, because in South Africa, we have never planned anything. Uh, and now when fate comes, it finds us on our knees with corruption, with zonto commission, and all these other things, which are really making our lives much more complex. This is despite the fact that uh, this country in terms of uh, data, uh, without patting myself on the back, back but uh, saying about us, as I say, and the staff there have produced the best data that can be available in any part of the world. I think uh, we are among the best. So in a way, while we couldn't uh, predict coronavirus, but uh, we could scenario the worst of scenarios based on the data that is available. Uh, we didn't do that either. So we didn't do that in scenarios. We didn't do that in planning. So at the moment, as we try to pull ourselves out of this, we don't have benchmarks that are credible that we can use to say where we are going. It puts the small businesses in much more dire situations if we have to think about that, despite the fact that uh, they were set, as set aside of 30%, which I think if we had, we had followed up on those, uh, small businesses would be in better position. So let me try and talk about what work we did relating to small, medium enterprises particularly those who are self-employed uh, through some service that we ran. I recall that uh, in 2005, when we produced these results uh, and we saw that this were about in the 30 billion uh, market, uh, Trevor Manuel was saying, well, so is that a taxable amount that we are actually leaving out of the, the pocket? And it, it is true, it was so, but uh, we are not paying enough attention to those even when the study came out. We repeated the study much later and it showed patterns that were very unpleasant in that uh, the small and medium enterprises and uh, the small self-employed were now dominated by men wherever there was something profitable, particularly entering the construction, the trade and all that, replacing women. And th th this is a very, very dire uh, statistic and uh, that was done in 2014. I don't know whether you would like me to share a, a, a few slides that discusses what the set aside would have tried to answer if the 30% was actually followed through. Because I think going forward, we may wish to do that, but I I'll come to that. Uh, slightly later rather than now, because I will, will like to look at that. Now, when we looked at uh, the, 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 these enterprises that we are talking about, they were the enterprises of last resort. The people went in there when they had failed to get a job, failed to do. So it, it, it never was a first choice to be in those kinds of environments. That's the, one of the, of the key problems. Even when people were in those environments, Financing and marketing were not part of the infrastructure that government, despite uh, the many uh, litany of things like CIS, what is a CIFA and all MAPISA and all those things and cooperatives. Government was an anchor of last visibility. The best people that these people can, could get loans from were the Mashonisas. So the, the, the e ecosystem of small enterprises in South Africa is besmatched by this tragedy of a lot of talk about them, 
but very little action on the ground. And when something like coronavirus comes, it sinks them under the ground forever. And the gender lens on this, it's a very crucial lens and leaves you quite shocked. Not because uh, you didn't know, but shocked in the devastation that this will have, including on households because women were the predominant factor in these kinds of situations. When it comes to where these facilities, where this uh, 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 operated, you found that they operated without electricity, without water, without, so the infrastructure, the ecosystem has not been at all favorable. Perhaps this is the time to think quite carefully as to what has to happen going forward. And as we do that, I would like to go into one of the uh, studies that we undertook, particularly thinking about what the 30% set aside would have implied uh, for these kinds of businesses. I, I leave it there, uh, Kizo. Thank you very much, Dr. Pali, for that. And with that, I would like to bring in a, a businessman who we all know, and also the president of Black Business Council, Mr. Sandy Lezungu. Mr. Zungu, leveraging from what uh, uh, Dr. Pali just mentioned, looking at infrastructure, ecosystem, and so on, from a private sector perspective, how is unemployment in South Africa currently affecting the vision that government has, or even the vision that BBC has on transformation in the country. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Kizita. Um, thank you for including me in this uh, very august panel uh, with uh, such eminence um, among us. You know, the a vision for South Africa 2030, which is well captured in the National De Development Plan, um, envisages unemployment um, being halved, uh, hoovering in the low tens, um, envisages inequality being significantly uh, dealt with. Uh, envisages black participation in the economy uh, being significantly higher than what it was at the time of the adoption of the National De Development Plan. By all measures and standards, even before COVID-19, uh, we were lagging behind in terms of um, our objectives, simply because uh, underpinning all of this was gonna be a performing economy. 5%, 6% to 7% economic growth um, on an annual basis um, would have really carried our sins away. Um, but as you know, in the last uh, decade or so, uh, we've hardly ever performed above 2.5%. Uh, uh, so our performance has been um, very poor to say the least. Uh, come COVID-19, um, when we are faced with a crisis, uh, people quite honestly think that um, transforming the economy is a luxury that can be parked somewhere out there and let's deal with more serious issues. Um, hence the audacity of the likes of Afro Forum to take the Minister for Tourism to court because um, in the allocation of uh, relief measures, uh, triple BEE considerations will have weighed very heavy in the application of such uh, mega resources. Um, because people generally believe that um, empowerment or transforming the economy is a luxury. Uh, what matters is uh, food on the table um, and uh, health relief, and so on. And so there's no question about it that uh, uh, transformation is suffering right now. Um, not only our vision as a Black Business Council for how the economy must transform, 
but also just South Africa's uh, vision for transformation as captured in the National Development Plan is indeed suffering right now. Um, it, it is very imperative that uh, we go back to the fundamentals. Uh, what will enable South Africa to steer the transformation shape in the right direction? Uh, I've always argued that um, there's an inherent historical uh, bias in our system in favor of big business um, and uh, jeopardizing the interests of small business. Uh, what others would have called um, uh, Jumboism, where we worship a uh, big and we think it's the best. Uh, what you'll have seen instead that in the last uh, just six weeks of um, lockdown, it is mainly the SME sector which is trying their damnest best to get the economy to run, who are basically um, wanting to create space for themselves to supply PPEs and who are saying, what can they do to get some economic activity in their locations uh, going? Uh, big business, some of them in the automotive sector, for example, um, un even unprompted uh, by uh, the, the conditions on the ground, and have said, let's shut down production simply because uh, our head office in Toyota say so, or our head offices in Germany say so. Let's shut down irrespective because we have to protect the brand. Um, we cannot afford the risk of being associated with um, you know, spread of uh, or contamination in our factory. Um, small businesses are yearning to get going, uh, to create employment, to maybe because they are survivalists, but also because they just wanna get going. They wanna um, take advantage of the gaps that are offered here and there. Um, so for transformation to really be embedded in our society, we have to rely to a very large extent on the SMME sector. Um, and it is those people that we can also rely on um, for employment and uh, sustainable economic growth. So indeed, um, that's why we are so focused as a Black Business Council on this sector. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Sandy Lezungu. And Hanesh, if you look at what, or if you listen to what Dr. Pali and 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 um, Sandy Les mentioned, so it seems that there is a system challenge, and not just in South Africa, but globally also. Looking at how skewed many economies are, why is skewed more towards uh, towards big businesses and so on. So, so I want I want to find out from you as World Bank. You are partnering with various countries to accelerate response to COVID-19 and ensure that various countries are supported during this time. What has been your role in South Africa? And maybe share more on what is happening also within the countries that you are responsible for. But before you do that, kindly introduce yourself and please then answer the question. Hi, uh, hello, good afternoon. And, and thank you very much, uh, Kizito, uh, for, for inviting the World Bank to this uh, to this webinar, which is very timely and, and really important, I think, to have these conversations uh, around the support for firms. So my name is Ganesh Rasagam. I just relocated from Washington to Pretoria about three months ago, and I spent most of my time in South Africa under lockdown, unfortunately. Um, so I lead the, the um, I'm a lead private sector specialist, and again, I my country director, Marie Francoise, conveys her apologies for not being able to be here today. Uh, so uh, I think it was very um, interesting to hear from my, my fellow panelists uh, of the challenges that, that firms uh, are facing uh, in South Africa. And, and as, as we all know, this is an unprecedented crisis in our generation. We, we do not have, uh, we have some lessons from other crises, but this, the scale of this, this crisis and the impact on lives uh, has been has been simply disruptive, overwhelmingly disruptive. So in, in South Af Africa, we've been engaged with counterparts from the government, uh, from National Treasury, from the Department of Small Business Development. Uh, we've been engaged uh, in conversations on how we can we can support the government in in firstly 
in an emergency response in protecting lives, which is the, the, the primary focus now. And then also in making sure that we can protect and restore livelihoods of, of the people affected by the, by the crisis and looking towards recovery and growth uh, eventually once the pandemic is under control. Uh, so we, we have uh, brought sort of international experience and lessons from other countries uh, we have shared this with our counterparts, uh, engaged in various conversations with them, more specifically with the Department of Small Business Development. We are supporting them to launch a pulse survey, which is a rapid survey, just like the ones that you, you have uh, done, Kizito, uh, of SMEs across various sectors, across various uh, provinces to understand uh, in a little bit more detail what has been the impact on their businesses, um, how are they responding to the relief measures provided by the government? What additional support do they need? And so forth. So that we get real time data from firms, which will help to improve the support being provided to these firms. Uh, this will be carried out periodically in every few months to keep track of, of how firms are coping uh, with the crisis. Uh, our colleagues in IFC have, have put in place facilities to ensure liquidity in the, in the system to support businesses. Uh, and they are also working to support firms in the tourism sector and in the automotive sector uh, through, this, through this crisis. So um, we must congratulate the South African government for their proactivity uh, in managing this crisis and, and the way they have uh, uh, come on board very quickly to put in relief support measures uh, for, for individuals and, and firms. And we look forward to, to working closer uh, with them going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hanesh. I really appreciate it. I would like to bring in Tahir. Tahir is a co-founder of Analytical Technology, which is a startup company based at Sloan. And Tahir, I want to find out, as a startup, and you are now representing SMEs or startups, um, you are their voice in this, in this discussion. How are you coping over the past one month? And, and being a, a tech company, have you noticed minimal disruption within your operations? And how have you been coping? And before you do that, kindly introduce yourself also. Hi, my name is Tahir Musa, and I'm the co-founder of Analytical Technologies. Um, firstly, I'd just like to say, uh, that I'm honored and humbled, humbled to be part of this panel. Um, you know, as a small business, any sort of airtime would be good for us. So to give you an idea on what we do, Analytical Technologies um, is a software company. And what we do is that we specialize uh, in development of bespoke software solutions. So what that simply means is that if you have an organization with a particular requirement and you look out there for a product off the shelf and you can't find something uh, that meets uh, your business requirement, uh, we are the guys to build it for you. Um, thanks, and to get back to the question, Kezito, uh, uh, we are an IT company and there has been disruption um, we were able to uh, mitigate some of the issues. Um, so part of it was that um, we had to enable all of our staff uh, to be able to operate from home. Um, as you know, a challenge in South Africa is bandwidth, for instance. So even though our employees are prof professionals within the IT industry, uh, we had to go out and purchase uh, bandwidth and data bundles for them uh, to be able to operate. I think the second biggest challenge that we had was um, we had to purchase software uh, in some form to be able to connect uh, to our, our, our clients' uh, servers or infrastructure. So there has been a bit of disruption but as being an, a software development company, I think we were able to overcome it easier than it would be uh, for other types of firms. I think another big thing um, is that there wasn't a major disruption uh, to our operations. 
because our operations are backed by contracts and usually the contracts uh, run from six months to a year. Um, so the current impact on us is not immediate. Um, but as we all know that this crisis is affecting everybody in South Africa. And eventually this is going to come to us. But for now, I think that uh, we were cushioned uh, of, with uh, the contracts being in place. Thank you very much, Tahir. I will come back to you soon. So I would like to go to Advocate Nto Mulu, the President of South Africa, of South African Chamber of Commerce and Industry. At Saki, they boast 20,000 SMEs in their membership. Advocate, I wanna know how are your members doing during this period? And before you answer, please also introduce yourself. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Kizito. Um, you know, greetings to my fellow panelists and to all the participants in this webinar. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, my name is Mtok Ulu. Uh, I'm the president of the South African Chamber of Commerce and Industry. I'm an entrepreneur in my own right uh, with an interest in an investment holdings company. And I also serve on the board of the uh, Small Enterprise Development Agency and Business Unity South Africa. So in this time that we find ourselves in, um, one has been involved in a lot of uh, interactions with SMEs. I think first starting with the membership of Saki. Our membership is largely organized through chambers that are scattered throughout the country. And the membership profile there uh, is largely biased towards the side of uh, SMEs. And uh, the 20,000 of SMEs really comes from the 40 odd chambers that are under our membership. And all of them, uh, you know, as the head of the organization, have expressed their own concerns on the impact that uh, they've had because our members are in all sectors. And you know, with the hard lockdown, you find you found a lot of sectors being affected, you know, with very little time to prepare, uh, great levels of anxiety and 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 and, and frustration. So in the first few weeks, you had a lot of problems and that required us to work closely with government and organize business formations to ensure that we really make sure that communication and sufficient communication goes out to all SMEs. And we've been receiving a lot of feedback on the challenges. The challenges are naturally on the viability of business, you know, the fact that uh, people are forced to work from home. Not all businesses are able to work from home. You also have challenges of, you know, uh, uh, lower revenues that are going to obviously impact on the number of plans that have been there. Uh, issues of expenses and running and operating expenses. Uh, you know, we found ourselves in a situation where there were not enough relief measures provided by government, and also a lot of challenges in terms of accessing some of the other private sector relief measures that came uh, 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 on board. But the problem uh, and the impact of COVID uh, on SMEs has also posed a greater risk on uh, the economy as a whole, because SMEs find themselves very instrumental in terms of servicing the number of sectors in the country. And when you have challenges amongst SMEs, you're actually posing a greater risk for the entire economy, because uh, you, know, uh, you have a situation where SMEs now are facing you know, threats of closure, uh, you know, interruptions in supply chain, interruptions in uh, normal cause of business and productivity. And that obviously has a ripple effect uh, throughout the economy. So uh, SMEs uh, are worthy of a certain level of focus and attention because they are you know, a group of uh, or economic actors that are important to keep the economy going because they, they are, have an appetite to remain in business, but also they are important because they serve as uh, our, our, our growth in engines and they link up with all the innovation that we seek to achieve in the dominant sectors of the economy. So certainly uh, the impact has been huge, has been felt throughout the, our membership. And uh, you know it mirrors the results that uh, came uh, out of the survey that the Sloan 20, on 22 compiled. And uh, you know, there's no, we're, not, we're not immune to all those challenges, but we also have a responsibility, obviously, to be proactive in protection and advancement of SMEs. Thanks.
Thank you very much, Advocate. Mr. Zungu, um, so all SMEs has been affected, and you made a good point that most times there is that gloves that protect bigger businesses than smaller businesses. <coughs> Our study predicts that 55,000 SMEs might not exist post COVID 19. As BBC, how will some of the policies you sit on NEDLAC, you sit on Business for South Africa, which is now a new initiative, uh, working on, on helping uh, the government with this, with this uh, responding to this challenge. How will your organization ensure that 55,000 SMEs don't go bust tomorrow, according to our, our report? Well, you know, that's a very uh, good question. Um, I think in the survey, first of all, that you conducted is a very a very good survey. I read um, the write-up and uh, it's, it's quite compelling in terms of its findings. Uh, th thank you uh, for, for, for commissioning that. Um, the truth of the matter is that the longer the lockdown, um, which I must emphasize here, um, all evidence points to it having been very um, necessary from a public health point of view. But the longer it drags, um, the more the SMS M is will suffer. Uh, people talk about the mortality of uh, humans. Um, SMMEs and businesses in general also have a mortality rate. Um, the longer it drags out, um, the more SMMEs will say, even if you say the lockdown is lifted, they'll say, I'm not going to go back to business because this, the start will be very slow. Uh, I don't have working capital to take care of the, the overheads. Uh, I don't even have liquidity to stock up um, and basically to re-advertise that I'm back in business. By the time uh, I operate at full capacity, it will be three months later, I will have had to bear with the, the monthly losses. So most SMMEs don't have much leg room or headspace to really take the chance. Uh, hence, the mortality rate is very high um, and it's a reality. So what we have been doing as a Black Business Council, one is to argue um, for a, a, a more responsible and a measured approach on the lifting of lockdown and to affect um, as many sectors as possible without compromising the good that we've uh, achieved so far in terms of social distancing and flattening the curve. And to basically point out that the path that we're traversing as South Africa on this COVID um, pandemic, um, it looks to be a, an optimistic path and we need to reward ourselves somehow uh, rather, rather than being very hard on ourselves. So our influence will have been to, to persuade the decision makers to take a much more realistic approach on the path that we're traversing, number one. And number two, to, to argue for a greater allocation of um, funds uh, towards the SME sector. Uh, the 500 billion rands in terms of the stimulus package um, has got a 200 billion rands loan guarantee scheme um, of which commercial banks will be a major player there. Um, we've tried to impress upon them that uh, of that 200 billion rands, uh, a large portion thereof must be towards uh, propping up the SMMEs who want to get back in business. Um, and we're also very pleased that um, a greater allocation has been given towards uh, township economies, spaza shops, uh, suppose hawkers, um, shisanyamas, um, you know, uh, car wash businesses, which are quite um, prevalent in, in, in many African townships. And that is courtesy to the uh, drive by the Black Business Council that such an allocation was made in the first place. And it's a, it's a massive improvement from the original 100 million rands, which had been drawn down prior to the announcement of the, um, uh, of the, uh, uh, the scheme. Um, now, so what we are moving for is that even the issues like the Solidarity Fund, um, 
the allocation must be given towards SMMEs. Rupert's allocation towards uh, the business partners, again, we're calling for SMMEs to benefit from that. In any case, business partners will argue it's aimed at SMMEs, but we've made a specific request that uh, black SMMEs who may not be historical um, clients of business partners must be encouraged uh, and must get a large share of this because uh, transformation must remain an imperative even during these very tough times. So our intervention as Black Business Council has been at uh, multilateral fronts at uh, multiple levels, at both legislation level, uh, relief funds, and just to talk to the spirit of um, supporting small businesses and, and that um, to remind South Africa that uh, our solutions to youth unemployment, our solutions to sustainable economic growth or lack thereof um, lie through the uh, small to medium businesses support and um, nature. Thank you very much, Sandile. And uh, we must thank you for all the efforts. Um, I mm -hmm. must say I've noticed that quite a lot from yourself, from your CEO, and so on, how you've been fighting for small businesses, especially also black owned businesses and so on. Thank you. You know, I think the situation that we also face is a situation that affects um, all races, but also you made a good point to say that black businesses historically will not have some of the requirements that are being put through for some of these institutions to be able to assess those facilities. So thank you for, for, for fighting that fight. But I would like to bring Dr. Pali into, into the mix now. Doc, in OECD countries, 70% of GDPs in most OECD countries are being contributed via SMMEs. In South Africa, this could be different. What are SMMEs contribution to South Africa and are we really appreciating the, the, the contribution that SME is putting to our economy in South Africa? So, um, the, I, I, I'll break it down, not only from a GDP point of view, but uh, from an employment uh, point of view, that uh, SMMEs employ the bulk of the labor force uh, as opposed to uh, big business. For instance, if I came into the informal sector, while its contribution to GDP is about 6%, and that uh, informal sector includes, or rather the SMMEs include in them, the informal sector, it contributes 6% to the GDP, but in terms of employment, comes in at more than uh, 15%. So if you add the, 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 the SMMEs on top of that, uh, the contribution of SMMEs to GDP may not be as significant, but it is not because they can't make a significant contribution, but it's because of the concentrated nature of business in South Africa, particularly in the area of mining and uh, manufacturing. Retail, yes, it's a lot more distributed, but it is in the main a very concentrated uh, business too. So you, you can look at whichever business in South Africa, it's all very, very much uh, concentrated. Even in the financial services sector, it has come in as a, a very, very concentrated business. So the answer to the question that you are posing, that 70% uh, is SMMEs in OECD, it speaks to the level of the Gini coefficient in that environment where inequality is not as pronounced as it is in South Africa. And that inequality level is answered by the less concentration of business activity in a few hands. In South Africa, the Gini coefficient 
because we have to think about uh, to what effect are we talking about business? It has to be about people. 69% Gini coefficient almost labels South Africa as the highest, and as a society with the highest inequality. And the genesis of that is because we don't have significant SMMEs. And the, the, I would say that it's not because SMMEs are impossible to have, but it's because of the monopoly position that business in mining, in manufacturing, and in retail has uh, in South Africa, even in the new economy of uh, the services economy and uh, tech economy, you see uh, this level of uh, concentration. So, Therefore, so to answer the question as we proceed, we really have to fight this concentration. And I agree with Dade uh, Zungu uh, that, uh, well, uh, in fact, coronavirus is a stimulus for getting SMMEs going. There is no postponement of that. Uh, like Lincoln said, slavery will be resolved through war. These two things have to go together. We can't say war first or peace first before slavery. So war is an instrument of re uh, removing slavery. So is coronavirus an instrument for ensuring that uh, SMMEs uh, participate? Thank you very much, Dr. Pali. So you are arguing that we need a new economy going forward. And this new economy, we need to find a way to open it up to various SMEs to participate because we all believe that SMEs have a big role to play in the economy of, of, of the country. Before I bring in Hanesh from the World Bank, I would just like to uh, remind the participants that you can use the Q&A button to ask your questions um, um, on that. And if you do have friends that are trying to join in but you could not come into the room because I can see that the room is full already, please give them the YouTube link. My colleagues are putting the YouTube link down on the chat button. So you can copy the link on the chat button and share it with, uh, with, uh, with your friends or colleagues that are trying to join in. Hanesh, I would like to bring you in into this mix. And I want to ask you, you have all these facilities that you are making available for various countries for private public sector response to COVID. 19. Our study shows that 92% of small businesses has been affected by, the, by this pandemic. What role can the stakeholders you are engaging, private and public sector, play in supporting small businesses? For the SMMEs listening today, what does support really mean? World Bank, you are talking to private public sector. If you give them facility to say, use this facility and help your country. What does that mean for SMEs? Thank you, uh, uh, Kuzito. And I think that's a really powerful question. Uh, I think my, my fellow panelists, um, Mr. Sandili, uh, described the challenges that, that have been faced by, by the SMEs uh, currently. Um, from what we can see, the, the economic shock that businesses are experiencing now, the SMEs are, experiencing now were transmitted through four channels. Firstly is they are falling demand. They're losing customers. They're unable to attract new customers and, and some of them have closed down because they've run out of business. Two is supply chains are disrupted. The input supplies are, are affected. So they're unable to, to, to produce and to, to sell things that were, they were doing before. Three, and very critically, is a tightening of credit conditions and liquidity, the liquidity crunch. They just, they just don't have the money to pay workers. So they lay off their workers, they have to cut corners, they're struggling to survive. And, and fourthly, it's, it's a broader issue of the rising uncertainty. You know, How does lockdown face out? Uh, how, how, what can they do? What can they do? When will businesses pick up? So there's a whole lot of questions that to which we have, don't have any clear answers at the moment. So if you look at this, this the, the transmission of these shocks to firms, the immediate objective in the short term, I think what, what support means would be to address liquidity challenges, to, to limit firm closures and bankruptcies, and to prevent 
widespread layoffs to protect jobs. That would be the focus of, of the immediate emergency response measures. And it's really important that this type of support is delivered as quick as possible, it's rapid, it's transparent, meaning it's easy to access, the rules of the game are clear, everyone knows where to go for this support and how to apply for this support. And, and they get this support quickly and, and relatively painlessly. I mean, the last thing that you want uh, for an SME to do now is to go and fill up forms and, and wait in lines uh, with uncertain um, bureaucratic procedures. And thirdly, it has to be time bound. So this, some of these measures we have to put in now, emergency measures, and very clearly they cannot continue for a long period of time. So grant support, for example. So what are the possible support measures that countries have implemented during this emergency phase, let's say, the crisis phase? So grants, for, for sure, grant support. Suspension, cancellation, reprofiling of financial obligations, such as taxes, you know, rental payments, utility payments. These are some of the instruments that have been implemented and, and very welcomed by, by SMEs. And then other instruments, I think my colleague alluded to, like the guarantee facilities, you know, concessional lending, uh, special policies to provide liquidity support, trade financing, factoring, tax credits, like, like even a list of things, but these have to be tailored to the, to the needs of, of, of these businesses, right? And hence I go back to, and, and, and I really again commend you uh, and uh, Solon 22 for this COVID uh, response survey, because we need real data uh, from, from firms so that we can respond appropriately in terms of the support being provided. Now, let's not forget the informal businesses, the ones that are in the township, the spaza shops, because this, some of these businesses are, are, are you know, very, very badly affected, right? And it's very unclear whether they even qualify So some of the relief measures that are in place. There are some, uh, some of the other pulse surveys that I've seen where out of, you know, a survey of, just a small surveys run by, for example, University of Cape Town, where they surveyed about uh, a couple of hundred people. And they found that very few of this, this um, informal firms actually are eligible for, for support, right? So how can we uh, extend or expand the support to these informal uh, 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 enterprises? Uh, because they are really struggling. And, and that, that is something that we need to think about and, and explore so that they get support uh, quickly. And we're not talking about support that is tied to making them formal. I think that's not the point. Either. The point is to, is to identify them uh, and, and make sure that they are supported through this, this crisis. I'll stop here for now. Thanks very much, Hanesh. So support must be rapid, it must be quick. SMEs must not stand in line. And I'm even seeing a lot of questions. Uh, a lot of the SMEs are saying they've applied for UIF funding, they've applied for DSBD funding. It's 14 days ago and no response. And it goes back to what Hanesh is saying that measures must be time bound because now is a time that SMEs need a swift response to be able to make decisions on their businesses and so on. And also looking at the informal economy and so on, a lot of support, a lot of these initiatives sometimes focuses on the formal economy, but I know that NYDA has also launched something for informal businesses. I know that advocates, you, you, are, you, are, you, are, you are in the board of CEDA and, and I know CEDA has quite a few responses for formal and informal businesses. Uh, re research shows that 80% of Africa's workforce work in the informal economy, and we risk losing um, a lot of these workforce. What are we doing in South Africa to support the informal businesses that are struggling, that know that they need to keep their doors open to be able to survive during this period? Advocate Nto, please, uh, please share with me what you're doing currently. Yeah, uh, thank you uh, once again. I think uh, the starting point is really to appreciate, you know, the dynamism and the uh, great sense of uh, speed and intensity that we've seen from the Department of Small Business Development in putting together relief measures that are aimed at SMEs. And of late, obviously, uh, this, as these schemes have been added and one on the informal trade has been has been newly uh, uh, announced. Now, remember that, uh, you know, with the SMEs, uh, they all find themselves in different uh, situations with different problems. And the uh, DSPD has been very central in creating 
products that are, are aimed at various SMEs with different challenges, but also making sure that uh, the SME agenda is being driven within the economic cluster of, um, of cabinet. So the relief measures uh, show that uh, there's been uh, an uptake. I know that we had a small, uh, a, a, a difficult start in the beginning, but such was the nature of the crisis that once uh, you know, the national disaster was announced and eventually the lockdown, uh, you know, we had to move with speed in creating programs. So a database uh, uh, is, uh, is live and created on SMEs to register. And that's really a database where you register so that we are able to capture you because as a country, we don't have a single database of all SMEs. Uh, you know, we all are, are, are getting numbers from different sources. So most uh, people uh, would have uh, entered and first, first point was the SME database. CIDA and CIFA as being the agencies responsible for this response have you know, uh, put in place measures and work day and night to ensure that from the CIFA side, financial relief is supported. But if you find yourself in a situation where there are certain requirements that are, lack, are, are lacking on the part of the SME, CIDA has been there to provide the necessary support and non-financial support. But, uh, you know, 500 million or so that we started off with was never going to be sufficient. And, uh, you know, for to date, uh, the department speaks of a, a disbursement, I think, of around 280 million from CIDA, from um, CIFA, and about 7,000 businesses have been referred to CIDA for, you know, uh, more support for them to eventually get the relief measures. The president mentioned that uh, the support will have to be extended to uh, the number of around 2 billion rands you know, for these uh, smaller relief measures. Um, that's uh, all being done to make sure that we cast the net a bit wider to include as many people as possible in the, in the different manif manifestation of SMEs in South Africa. It all, this also will need us, obviously, to also take it further and not just focus on CIDA and CIFA but also look at what other DF, uh, DFIs are able to do because uh, you know, in, in every province, you have a form of uh, enterprise development agency within uh, the economic development department. We need to start extending more support to those agencies. And in light of the president's adoption of the district-based model, uh, you know, there's also a lot of uh, local economic development expectations that have been created by LD offices in local and district uh, level um, municipalities. And that is very important because uh, through that, we'll be able to cover as, as broadly as possible um, you know, our, our SMEs. The informal sector, unfortunately, you know, it will be difficult for us to have sustainable and uh, impactful support uh, if we don't allow SMEs uh, and this informal economy to be formalized in a, in a way that I call, you know, developmental formalization. You know, a lot of times formal, the form, uh, informal economy has been attempted to be regulated in a more police-driven police manner, you know, uh, whereas we need to protect and support the informal economy in such a way that it creates a sustainable pipeline for the development of the SME community in South Africa. So the, the current um, uh, uh, relief measure is very limited in its nature. You know, very few uh, uh, people have, have taken it up. And I think it talks about how then do we work as social partners to advocate for more awareness on all these um, initiatives, but also encourage uh, the various actors within the economic space, especially the DFIs, to bring up on board more of uh, informal economic traders so that we can start formalizing them. Because any intervention that we want to provide to SMEs and in the informal economy needs to link up to the national development objectives. And without some level of formalization and understanding where these businesses are in what sectors and what they are doing, it becomes difficult to have a sustainable and a structured program that is linked to national development objectives. But I think CIDA and CIFA has been able to provide immediate relief for a lot of businesses. Some of these initiatives uh, are out there and working with um, you know, uh, organized business, a lot of 
support have also been pledged to make sure that we increase the capacity of agencies that are meant to uh, to provide relief measures. Moving forward, obviously, as the lockdown almost matures, you know, if, if for lack of a better word, because it's still going to be with us for as long as we find a vaccine, we need to make sure that we expand the pool of resources that are available, we intensify the support that is provided, and that also will speak to the reorganization of the economy so that we are, we are able to create the new economic patterns and formalization should then be linked to a national development objectives of the country. Thank you very much, Advocate. And um, so I just want to mention to the audience that we have a polling running, running now, so please feel free to answer questions from the polling. We've received nine questions in total, but before I get to the questions, I just want to bring in Tahir. Tahir, as a tech business, you've been cushioned a bit to be able to operate virtually. You have clients that you've been working with on a six months, 12 months contract, and it hasn't been disrupted as much. You have friends also that are not tech focused businesses. What can you tell us about where they are? What are their challenges? Do you think that a lot of them have been able to receive support either from some of these uh, facilities that's been provided so far? Um, so maybe I just want to come back a bit and uh, explain uh, a little bit of, about our business model and where we seen our business growing. Uh, so being a software company, what we initially started off doing uh, was operating in the consultancy space. And I think the big idea behind operating in the consultancy space uh, was that that where our expertise lied and we knew that there was a demand uh, for this particular skill in the industry. Uh, the types of businesses that we provided our services to were the large corporates we quickly realized that um, our business needed to grow. And uh, in order to, to facilitate this growth, uh, we needed some sort of um, pipeline mechanism. So the next structure within our, within our business was to actually bring in project-based uh, development. So what that means is that um, we outsource a complete uh, IT project from our clients. We develop it on site and uh, then we do de delivery of the, uh, of the software. Uh, so the idea behind this was that we use it as a training platform uh, for juniors. We use it as a platform uh, for getting interns up to speed and also building in our pipeline so that we able to uh, provide resources into the consultancy part of our business um, uh, as quickly as possible so we don't lose the business to competitors. And I think that's the stage that we've been in. Um, so although, you know, coming back to your comment saying that we've been cushioned, yes, we've been cushioned, but the cushion is only going to last for a certain amount of time. The first thing is before COVID-19 hit us, um, we have had um, conversations with our clients and the economy was in a very tough place. So uh, that put a spanner already into the works. Uh, the next thing is that uh, with our uh, phased approach, our end idea, so we had our consultancy part of our business, our project-based work that we done in-house, the end idea uh, to put analytical technologies, uh, 22 on Sloan and even South Africa on the map was to build a software product where we identify firstly our customers would need um, and then send it uh, to the rest of the country, the rest of the region and the rest of the world. That was uh, the end idea. So um, now uh, our reserves uh, that we put into place were to take the company from uh, uh, through this uh, process strategy and deliver and if eventually become this company that owns a product that's uh, uh, put us, uh, the country and the continent on the map. Uh, you can see immediately when our clients start uh, feeling the impact of this uh, crisis, 
the first effect to us is that um, we're going to be cut off from future contracts. Uh, so what that means is that we'd be digging into our reserves and digging into our reserves actually means uh, that we're not able to, um, uh, to play out our strategy. So now development of that product, which is what South Africa needs, um, is being put on hold. Uh, the other part maybe to, to answer is that we as a company, um, some of the, the relief measures we weren't able to access it. Um, even though our business is 66% black owned and we have female ownership within it, um, one of our partners is a foreign national. So um, lots of the relief measures that were put into place actually excluded uh, foreign ownership. Um, so that definitely meant uh, us digging into our reserves. Um, so with regards to other small businesses that we've chatted to, um, I haven't met yet anybody or any business uh, that has benefited from any of the schemes. I think maybe it's early days and uh, you know, us being in lockdown, we haven't had the opportunities to be networking as much as we should be uh, networking. Um, but I found it interesting uh, to give you uh, an idea of what's happening on the ground. Uh, so some of, uh, of my colleagues that are involved in the used car market, um, that industry has almost come to a complete grinding halt. Uh, and what they've done is that they pivoted. Um, lots of people are getting involved in uh, selling of, uh, of pharmaceutical products, sanitizers, uh, masks and gloves. Um, so, uh, you know, they've taken their cash reserves, put it into that, and um, uh, that's what they're doing uh, uh, to keep themselves afloat. I, interestingly, I've spoken to some people who's in board manufacturing and in the furniture business, and uh, they, they hit uh, badly by this crisis. Um, but what they're trying to do in terms of pivoting their businesses um, is actually look at building... Um, coffins, uh, you know, there, were, there was uh, something that I watched on news uh, that there was a, a shortage at the stage in Britain of, of, of uh, coffins. So some of the guys are actually looking at pivoting their business in that way. And then I've spoken to other people who are in industries like tourism and uh, they don't even have an idea uh, on how uh, is their business or the industry going to recover from this? So thanks, thanks Tahir for that. I really appreciate your, your response. And um, I would like to go straight to the questions. And I mean, the, 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 the issues that the panelists raise are issues that are so critical for small businesses and so on. Before I go into the questions, we also have uh, the Hauteng uh, province joining us. And they are saying that if you want to know um, access to all the resources of national and provincial government that is made available for SMEs, you can also find that on covid19.ggda.co.za. So we'll also put the details on the, on the chat. Sandy, mm -hmm. please, I have some questions here for you. One is um, um, SMEs are saying that um, initially when all this started uh, from last month, it seems BBC was quiet. So they are now thanking you for, for really coming out over the past few weeks and lending your voice and uh, the fight for SMEs. One thing they would like to find out from you is the funds, the 200 uh, billion or so that's been made available through banks are banks gonna put in stringent, stringent measures for this, like credit checks and so on? So SMEs don't believe that they will get a fair assistance from banks. The second thing is also that they wanna find out, um, the second issue that they wanna find out from you is how a lot of government departments, public sector, private sector still owe SMEs. 
what will your organization do to tackle these two challenges of banks in terms of the facility being provided um, with less stringent measures? And then, um, and then also um, the second question. Thank you. <clears throat> I, I thank you, thank you, Kizito. I think the questions are very interesting. I've had a look at some of them. Um, I think uh, Mahoba um, hit the nail on the head. The Black Business Council is mainly focused on lobbying and advocacy. Um, and that's what we do quite effectively. Um, beyond that, we don't have the infrastructure to, to allocate resources. Some organizations have approached us to say, can we facilitate the distribution of these funds? And we've politely said, look, um, that should be more than what our infrastructure and capacity can afford at this stage. And um, let's rather focus on the advocacy. For example, when it comes to banks, if the SMMEs felt they would be maligned and possibly get a, an unfair share um, you know, of, of, of the proceeds, and they believe that the Black Business Council um, can talk for them, will gladly uh, take that responsibility. In fact, we, we have reached out to the banks to say, let's have a conversation how will this 200 billion rands be distributed? How can we ensure that um, SMMEs benefit? And how can we ensure that black businesses who may not be traditional clients of the commercial banks can also benefit? And we've even uh, tried to argue that um, organizations like the NEF um, who are traditionally in the empowerment space uh, can also play that role and can also be allocated a portion of the 200 billion rands. And in that sense, not only shall we make sure that uh, black businesses um, get some fair share of attention, uh, but also SMMEs uh, equally. <clears throat> so we, we, we are very much interested in SMMEs getting a loan share of this, um, not because we are um, just biased towards SMMEs for bias's sake, it's simply because we are convinced, quite honestly, that um, the solution to youth unemployment in this country and the solution to mediocre um, economic growth that we've witnessed over a long time um, will only change, will change the direct trajectory when we begin to be single-mindedly focused on supporting the SME sector. And that's, that, that task is going to start now, as uh, Dr. Lehotla correctly says. And Sandile, the second question on government departments to OEN people and some private sector institutions, uh, will you be able also to take up that fight? That, that's a very important question. You'll remember just before the lockdown, um, when everyone was hastily closing down, shutting down as if we we're going towards uh, the, the, the festive season, um, even National Treasury um, had issued some directive that um, the, the cutoff date for payments um, was almost immediate. And we made, we made a specific intervention that it could not be so when some SMM, SMME players have provided services and products and they have not been paid. So they needed to open the window a little bit more. Uh, but I don't believe that that was resolved at the time. There are some SMMEs who have approached us uh, who have provided not only services to government departments, but also to state-owned enterprises uh, who are crying that they've not been paid for months on end. Um, chief culprits, I don't have to name and shame, but there are many chief culprits uh, in the SOE sector who really are killing SMMEs. And some of the uh, individuals behind those SMMEs are facing sequestration in their businesses facing liquidation, uh, courtesy of a government um, or SOEs who are paying lip service to this commitment by the president, um, not only now, but also the previous pre president who said the SMEs must be paid within uh, 30 days. And with some government departments in provinces uh, priding themselves of paying SMEs within seven days, but uh, it's still not um, the universal, 
and SMEs are feeling uh, weakened by a, um, an, a, a government sector which uh, is walking roughshod over a need to, to honor their side of the bargain. Thank you very and, much. And, and Doc, Doc, I would like to bring you here, Dr. Pali. Are you, are you, Dr. Pali, I would like to bring you. So there are some questions I've seen on the, on the poll. So SMEs are saying that there has been a regional approach to this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And it's been, it seems to be working. But why is government not using similar approach to SMME development, supply chains, and ensuring that SMMEs in various regions benefit from various supply chains and so on? What do you think we need to do from your perspective, Dr. Pali? The question of a, a regional approach, uh, obviously, is a long-term thing. It fits in with Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement uh, and uh, should be the vehicle through which uh, we should see how the SMMEs uh, survive in the future. It is a, a necessary step, and uh, I think it has to be enhanced. And I think that I need to, to share my screen very briefly, uh, where is share screen here? Uh, here. Uh, now I have too many things here on my screen that you are not supposed to see, but uh, I thought I would have, uh, uh, can I just uh, close that and go back to the presentation that I thought I would need uh, to use for share screen? Uh, yeah, don't, don't I think me to Look, I think what you can do, maybe just send it to my email. I'll forward it to admin and they'll pull it mm. up. But in the and meantime, then I can, uh, uh, but uh, coming back to a regional approach, a, a regional approach in the first instance, and uh, tomorrow or yesterday, today is the 29th, on the 28th, the African Development Bank released the International Comparisons Program. That was on. That was the schedule. I don't know whether it was actually delivered at that time. Under the International Comparisons Program, that's the biggest global market of consumption, which gives you who, what we consume as a people across the world. And on the continent, as Africans, in South Africa, as South Africans. And this global market of consumption information is so crucial to the strategy for small, medium, and enterprises to tag into that because the markets of industrialization and production systems depend on what people consume. First, in terms of saying, knowing what is being consumed, in what quantity, and at what cost. Second, in influencing patterns of consumption. And it is that window of the future that is very, very crucial and that information is available and it fits in with the strategy for regional uh, systems. And I think in the context of COVID, uh, it's something that has to be watched very carefully. Unfortunately, this product that we produce as statisticians is only good in Africa for knowing how much subsistence you get when you go to, you stay in, in Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, or, or in Johannesburg in South Africa. So is it 200 rand uh, per night? And the World Bank knows uh, these kinds of things because it's run under, this ICP is run under uh, the World Bank. And the Chinese use it very effectively. And the European Union environment uses it very effectively. Only in Africa it's being used for knowing how much subsistence you get. And it's not used uh, for really informing our industrial strategy. Not even in the context of Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. Doc, Doc, thank you. And before, um, I would like to bring in Hanesh. Advocate Mto, I would like to come to you shortly, but I want to bring in Hanesh based on what Dr. Pali has just mentioned. Mm -hmm. So, Hanesh, um, looking at regional uh, systems, so same question I, I posed to Doc. Uh, we are responding to COVID-19 uh, uh, leveraging, looking at regional, regional plans and so on, and this seems to be working. But 
for SME development, we haven't been doing that. And Doc has mentioned something important, which is looking at consumption and production patterns in different regions across the world, in Africa, but specifically in South Africa. How would this uh, consumption and production patterns help us map out the regional support for SMEs? So that is the first question. The second question I want to pose to you, Hanesh, is that um, a lot of SMEs on the question line are saying that the support, the facilities that are being provided seems to be short term. It's not being thought through strategically to say, how do some of these support help SMEs to obtain uh, equity in the firms that they work for and become co-owners in the firms that they work for? I will, I will, I will allow you to, to, to answer, Ganesh. So on the first question, um, this is a global crisis and, and it affects uh, countries uh, in various ways and, and the impacts are cross-border. So if, I, if you look at value chains, let's look at the critical value chains in the region. Uh, a number of food value chains, for example, are being disrupted because workers cannot harvest crops, farmers cannot transport goods to the markets, Traditional markets are closed. Um, so supporting firms to maintain essential services, you know, supporting them to adjust their operations for social distancing between workers as well as customers, and then leveraging the use of digital technologies, you know, FinTech, e-commerce, online uh, platforms will, will, be, will be key. And, and each industry will, will be affected differently and will have to have uh, uh, tailored responses uh, uh, in, in responding to this, this, this challenge. Uh, so, so as mobility restrictions are eased with, 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 the, pro, with, the, with the, uh, the, the effects to, to manage the, the pan pandemic, then the policies will then have to be refocused towards supporting the growth of these enterprises, reco business recovery and growth. And, and there's a different set of, of, of responses that are needed, right? So there, there we're looking at, at reallocating resources to, to, to more efficient companies. Firms will have to restructure their businesses, looking at their balance sheets, looking at, at new business opportunities. And, and one thing to sort of avoid is to, to, to make sure that, that we're not propping up the zombie firms uh, through the crisis, right? So, so as, as Dr. Pali said earlier, uh, you know, he said that the coronavirus, coronavirus it should be seen as a stimulus. I think this is an opportunity to, to look at how do, you, how do you create a new generation of, of businesses? How do you remove regulatory obstacles for them? How do you improve the business environment for these firms? You know, making it easier to, to set up businesses and to exit businesses. So how, do you, to, how, how can you improve the effectiveness of, of financial and non-financial support to these firms? I think this, this will be the, the, the second phase of, of support for firms uh, and, and you know, there'll be changes in consumer behavior from this crisis uh, and, and firms will need to adjust their business models to a very different economic environment. And we really don't know yet how this environment will, will, will look. We have some ideas, but we're not quite sure how this will, 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 will shape up. So you know, firms' balance sheets will be affected. They, that in turn will affect the way they make decisions. Risk parameters will change. So, so what I'm, I'm trying to say, say is that we are at a stage of crisis response now, and, and we need to start thinking about the recovery phase, uh, and we need to, to, to use this opportunity to, to, to improve the overall ecosystem for, 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 for firms. Thank now, you. Can you repeat the second question, uh, Kizito? I, I may have answered it already. Yeah, so the second question was more SME saying they that employers are receiving all this facility, but is there no way to think strategically and differently where em employees should be brought in to be co-owners of firms, like an equity partnership or equity relief facility could be provided that will support employees to become integral part of the firms through an equity-based structure. I think that's a that's a firm level decision. I I I don't I don't think that that you can have a one size 
uh, fits all policy approach to, 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 to address a question like that. Uh, you know, firms have different ways of, 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 of looking at the equity structures and looking at employee participation. Uh, you can support, support these this initiatives, uh, but I think, I, think uh, I, would not, I would not advocate a, a policy response that, that sort of mandates firms to do uh, specific things like this, especially when they're going through a crisis and they're recovering from a crisis and, and they need to, to uh, grow and become profitable and, and employ, employ people. I think job creation is, is going to be the, the major, major challenge. And, and, and this was a challenge before the crisis. This will continue to be a challenge and even a bigger challenge post-crisis. I think the focus will be on creating jobs, uh, new jobs, better jobs, better quality jobs, uh, and jobs for, the, for underserved uh, segments of the population, for young people, uh, for women, uh, for, women uh, for people from, from underserved communities in the townships, and, and so on. I think that would be the focus of, of policy responses. Thank you very much, Hanesh. And um, I would like to ask a few, okay, the polls are ready, uh, the polls we did. Um, based on what has been shared by panelists, do you think it is easy to assess various forms of support? 6% of people said and 27% uh, of participants said no, and 5%, uh, sorry, sorry, I'm missing it. 53% of the participants said to an extent, 40% said no, and 7% said yes. So advocate in talk, um, forty percent of the people are saying that the access to various forms of support are not available. Fifty-three percent are saying to an extent. So only only seven percent are saying yes. And I want to bring you in now, based on the questions I've heard from various uh, 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 attendees. Three questions for you, and you can answer first, and then I would like to bring in Sandy Lezungu to also answer some of this. But advocate, you can go first. How long is this facility? Some people are saying that we're receiving this facility now, but in four or five months' time, we are running into trouble. What happens then? The second question is, some have applied and no response at this stage. And I know that you sit on BUSA, you sit on CEDA, and so on and sit on net black. Uh, will you be able to advise how some of these people can reach out to UIF and some of these institutions to say they've applied and there hasn't been any feedback for the past 14 days? The third question for you will be, yesterday there was an announcement. Uh, so there is a question, I'm reading the question that there was an announcement that only 104 spaza shops in the country has applied for this relief funding. While we know that there are thousands of spaza shops, over 50,000 spaza shops in the country. So what are we doing to really ensure that the people that really need this support get this support? So you have three questions. Feel free to answer um, in any order. And after that, I'll bring in Sandy Lezungu to also contribute. Yeah, thank you, sir. Um, thanks for the questions. I think. Uh, uh, we, we, we just need to ensure that, uh, you know, the communication is improved. Uh, uh, and as, as business for South Africa, there's a, a partnership that's been set up between BUSA and BBC called Business for South Africa. And one of the work streams there is uh, intervention, immediate interventions for SMEs. And through that, we've set up an automated WhatsApp bot that uh, uh, SMEs can reach out to that gives you a list of all the available relief measures. So relief measures have been communicated by and far, uh, you know, uh, to make sure that as many SMEs are able to access SM um, relief measures that are applicable to them. And I will give you the number, maybe you can take it down and the admin can put it up on the chat. So you register on a number 087-250-2600. It's an automated WhatsApp bot that uh, as, the, as organized business, we've kept track of all the relief measures available and we update it on a daily basis as relief measures are announced either by government or the private sector. It's easy to use, it's available in, I think, four languages already now. You get onto the system, you type in high, and then it gives you a menu of the different 
options, you choose the one that you want, and then you get the information about where to find relief, uh, the, the quantum of the relief, and the agency that is dispersing it. And uh, that is what uh, is currently available. Obviously, in terms of the duration of the relief measures, most of these uh, applications, remember, are also grant or approved based on business plans that would be furnished by the different firms. So uh, different companies might have different uh, requirements and the funds that are ultimately dispersed will then be linked to the requirement of specific businesses for the numbers that are, would be um, listed in the, in, the, in the business plans. But uh, if you talk about the UIF, UIF um, has been already earmarked for it to run for the next three months. And the minister has already made a pronouncement that you know, the longer we go on with these uh, uh, low levels of economic activity, we will have to find more resources to support the UIF scheme. Similarly, with the, the various uh, SME schemes, uh, what we currently have now is under a billion rents. It's definitely not sufficient to support SMEs who will be getting relief measures through CIFA and CEDA, and we will have to expand the pool. And hence the need to crowd in more resources and uh, either throughout all the various uh, DFIs within government or other uh, enterprise development actors throughout the value chain, whether they are public or private, to ensure that we have a larger pool of available relief measures. And all this, I think, will start coming out as uh, you know, the, the economy starts to reopen and we realize the extent that we, we need to support SMEs. What has also started to, to become a, a, a central um, work area within Business for South Africa is that we are starting to merge the health map uh, modeling with the economic modeling so that we can see you know, how the health um, uh, response is matching with the economic response. Because it is only when we have a proper uh, uh, health response that it will in influence when and how the economy will be reopened. And that economic model and the health model needs to start coming together. And once that starts coming together, we'll then be able to unearth uh, more uh, relief measures that uh, can be available to SMEs. In terms of uh, you know, uh, my access to structures such as a network, network has actually proven to be a, a valuable instrument of late because with the work that we are doing with Business for South Africa, we've been able to coordinate a lot of uh, the work that is required to fight the impact of uh, COVID-19 by supporting firstly the health stream working closely with the Ministry of Health and the various MECs to make sure that sufficient supplies are done and a portal being created to ensure that we have suppliers that can register on an independent and a transparent process and we can all monitor how uh, economic activity and SMEs can participate therein. But also moving forward, the social partnership that we have at NetLeg also needs to start getting us to a stage where we can talk about how do we then restructure the economy to make sure that it's, it's viable into the future? It's a great opportunity now you know, to start talking about how do we decentralize economic activity so that don't limit economic activity to the big major centers such as Johannesburg, Cape Town, and Devon, but talk about how do we decentralize economic activity? And also how then do we talk about the structure of the various sectors themselves? Because um, the former SG has mentioned that uh, there's a lot of concentration in, in the South African economy. And those are conversations that I think NetLab will have to take up to, for, for us to find a ways of breaking up almost the, the big four uh, players in each and every industry. You know, in that way, we can start creating uh, new economic patterns and also create new opportunities for SMEs. But I think the relief measures will definitely start finding different shapes as the economy starts reopening in, in the various levels that have been pronounced by the president. But communication, uh, and I think it's organized business, we've really tried to collate all the relief measures available, and they are available on an easy app such as WhatsApp. And on that number, we've listed all the relief measures that are out there and available for SMEs. Thank you very much, Advocate. Just to confirm, the number you mentioned was 087-250-2674. Yes, uh, and then uh, you just uh, send uh, your first message will be hi, and then, then an automated response will then 
be activated and then you will be directed to the list of uh, um, available measures. Thank you very much. I would like to bring in Mr. Zungu. Mr. Zungu, will you, will you like to add on to some of those three questions? So the first one was looking at an SME saying, I'm receiving this facility now, but in three, four months time, my business is gonna go down. It's gonna be difficult to get another facility. What do I do? Then the second important one, some have applied for the past 14 days. There has been no response at all. And I know you've answered this before, but what can we do to really accelerate the, 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 the response, the swift and prompt response needed? And then looking at Spaza Shop, informal business is only one of four Spaza Shops has applied for, for this funding. What do we need to do to ensure that some of these, um, um, some of these businesses in the informal economy take advantage of the opportunity presented by private and public sector funding? <clears throat> Well, uh, Advocate uh, Kulu has uh, done justice to the question. Uh, I won't add much to what is said. Um, suffice it to say, um, I would be very surprised if what we have seen is uh, 500 billion rands, 10% of GDP as a um, stimulus package will be the sum total of what government will be required to do especially towards the SME sector. Um, a lot more is required, and not because the SME sector is taking advantage of um, uh, uh, the, the, the lockdown and the COVID-19 um, and all the sympathy that goes for businesses. Um, simply because, you know, they, they really need assistance. I think they've been a forgotten sector for far too long. Uh, so something ought to be done to really bring them on a, a platform where they can sustain themselves. I don't think there's any self-respecting entrepreneur uh, who wants to continue uh, just relying on handouts for, for government. So when they say, please help us, they're not doing so just because uh, they want to rely on this thing ad infinitum. It's because it's really desperately needed. I, I hope government will heed that call. Um, with regards to the um, Spaza shops, um, it's obviously not surprising to me that only so few as uh, Spaza shops have, have applied for some form of relief. Um, and um, you can understand why there's been mixed messages uh, going to the Spaza shops, uh, going to the informal sector players. Uh, people are saying you must register for SARS with SARS, register for tax, you must uh, comply with this and that. Um, so there's a, there's a, a very, um, there's an undertone of begrudging SMMEs. Uh, there's an undertone of, uh, of saying, well, you don't deserve any assistance as a spaza shop. And hence people are possibly scared to come forward because they think that uh, they are overburdened um, with um, you know, almost like rejection. Uh, from the powers that be. So there's got to be a very objective and a deliberate communication message driven towards uh, that sector to encourage them uh, to come forth. But also there's got to be an endeavor to work with organizations that um, cater for the spaza shops. They, they are national organizations, they are regional, uh, and there are some local base like in Soweto um, reach out to them, especially those that um, are run by, um, you know, uh, South Africans, uh, to say, we are here to assist you. Yes, if the quid pro quo is, you must now going forward be registered, as the Minister of Finance has indicated, get registered, so that you are also open to health inspections on a regular basis. It's a fair game. Um, Spada shops must not be a menace to public health. Um, and indeed, they must be registered for all sorts of reasons. Uh, but for now, uh, there must be a deliberate and an objective uh, strategy to go out and communicate to them, said, please come forward. You are providing a service to society and you've been affected by the lockdown. And indeed, you need and deserve our assistance. Thank you very much, Sandila. I would like to bring in Dr. Pali here. So Dr. Pali, um, I would like to, so, and once more to all the participants, I would like to
convey our sincere apologies that it's an all male panel. Um, the, the female uh, leaders we invited had to be pulled into certain meetings. So our sincere apologies from that. And now Dr. Pali, we have a, 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 an, an answer, um, a question from Daniela. Daniela is saying the impact of women owned businesses is tremendous. That women are closing shops and businesses to cater for their children, doing homeschooling and taking care of even their husbands, partners, the elders and so on. But also women are often not in the forefront of the response to COVID-19. How do we ensure, and also this is always the same issue in terms of support for women-owned businesses, women assessing capital, and so on. There has always been, the system has always been skewed. In your own view, even with World Bank's report saying that bringing women into the mainstream economy and giving them access to capital, access to market, will actually make economy of various countries better. In your view, how do you ensure, how do we ensure that more women play an active role in, in, in development in their countries, but also more support goes to women SMMEs in the country? Environment of South Africa, and of course, more generally, but specifically in South Africa, it makes a lot of sense to do so. Uh, I, I need to just introduce a simple statistic. And I'm sure that statistics will change nine months from now uh, in favor of a better statistic, but I don't think it will change for, uh, for, for that for longer because uh, the problems are very, very systemic uh, in South Africa. 60% of fathers say they are married. And you would expect that there would be corresponding 60% of mothers. No, the corresponding number is 30%. So now you wonder who these fathers are married to. I mean, the coronavirus brings a very important, uh, sheds a very important light. And that's why I'm saying in nine months time, we are likely to see a very interesting pattern of uh, whose fathers the children are. So because of this very skewed statistic, which puts a lot of burdens on mothers, women are more deserving to get assistance. But the way this assistance has to be positioned must be accessible. I mean, uh, uh, Mr. Zungu has just said, uh, you, you don't say register or rather, if you only are registered, in fact, you must be able to say, here is a facility through which you register. In similar ways, women need that facility that is helpful. That is not just we want women, but understanding the kinds of uh, hurdles that women have to go over in order to access uh, systems of support for their own businesses. They are more vulnerable because, of course, the father that says he's a father is not even there to support the child in terms of homework and the like, because he's hardly ever there. In fact, they are not there, and the women have said, we only know only 30% of us to be uh, mothers with corresponding fathers. The other half doesn't. So they, 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 they the filial arrangements and the conjugal rights that exist within South Africa are so badly wired that women will always get the short end of the stick unless there are very, very explicit and deliberate systems that favor women, not only on paper, but they are institutionalized, they are embedded in the laws and in the actions. Otherwise, the instruments become very blind and blunt, and women don't even manage to see them. So I would advocate a very deliberate, not only policy, but a detailed plan on how women get assisted. 
and taking into account all the issues that I'm saying uh, hinder them uh, from getting uh, the kind of assistance they, they, they deserve. Thank you very much, Doc. And I would like to bring in uh, Tahir from Analytical Technologies. Tahir, as a startup, what future business opportunity do you really see post this pandemic? What has this pandemic uh, uh, brought out in your view? And what can startups look out for or take advantage of uh, during this time and beyond? Uh, so I, I can speak for for startups in the technical space. Um, I think what what we've easily identified is uh, organizations based uh, on manpower on human resources. Can you hear me, Kizito? Yeah, your network was breaking a bit. Please, can you um, um, go again? So what I can identify, what we've uh, is is mostly related to the the IT industry. Um, I think one big thing that we can comment on uh, is that we've identified that lots of organisations at the moment um, could see that the bottleneck being uh, human resources or manpower. Uh, this meaning that. If a, a crisis like this um, has to carry on for a longer period of time or resurface itself after going away, uh, the same set of issues would be there. Um, so I think from an IT perspective, uh, the solution to something like that would be automation. And I, th I think us as a business uh, would be able to, to pick up and are quite well positioned to pick up those sort of opportunities of automation uh, within the industry. Thank you very much, Tahir. And I would like to just mention to all the participants also that um, this is hosted by Twin Two on Sloan. So it's a startup campus based in Bryanston, where we have um, incubate startups, uh, mainly tech startups, tech enabled or tech centric startups. And we do incubation program, accelerator program. We also have co-working spaces where startups can work from. So you can rent a space here and connect with our community and so on. And um, I want to go back to, to, to Hanesh. Hanesh, I want, I want to ask, what are the new sectors and what kind of new entrepreneur needs to emerge out of uh, post COVID-19 and what are the new sectors that you think that will drive um, um, global economy and even South Africa's economy going forward? If I knew the answer to that question, uh, uh, Gizito, <laughs> I'll be a very rich man. <laughs> I think it's a great question. And, and uh, uh, so you can see that that as I said earlier, that there's some things emerging from this crisis, for example, remote working, the need for, for you know, online communication tools, uh, you know, the story of Zoom and Microsoft and so on. So, so these are new products that people are, 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 are really interested in. And, and you know, the whole issue of innovation in the health sector, right? I mean, this is a wake up call for all of us that we need more efforts to look at at how are we can be better prepared for the next pandemic, right? How can we be better organized in terms of medical uh, uh, supplies and, and the response system of the medical infrastructure? Um, so new ways of working, new ways of social interactions, um, focusing on, on the health sector. I think the digital transformation agenda will be huge, uh, as, as uh, my colleague Tahir just, just mentioned. There are new business opportunities coming from, coming from that. Digital platforms that provide services that connect uh, uh, entrepreneurs, a new way of reaching uh, uh, entrepreneurs who are underserved. You know, uh, for example, in uh, women entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs in townships, maybe they can, they can be connected through digital uh, the trading platforms. So that's a whole new agenda uh, that, that potentially could, could, could come out. 
And, and then we're looking at supply chains. So supply chains now and uh, value chains, uh, let's say value chains that emerge from the crisis, they, I think they, they will, people revisit the way this, uh, these chains can be made more, more efficient. Uh, again, using digital, digital platforms, but, but also uh, how can you uh, uh, bring in ICT enabled services and automation to improve productivity uh, to facilitate participation in, in, in like e-commerce. Um, the skills required uh, for these new technologies, upgrading of worker skills, uh, digital skills, STEM skills, uh, how can we deliver these skills uh, to a broader segment of the population? I think that would be another uh, uh, new business opportunity emerging. So uh, yes, so in every crisis, there's an opportunity. And, and I think these are the opportunities that that we see some of the, some of the which that we see coming up with which and some that we don't even know yet uh, that that will emerge. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Hanesh. And um, I would like to bring in uh, Dr. Pali. Um, Dr. Pali, so there is a risk of hyperinflation in the future. This is a question. Is this factored? Do you think this is factored into the economic scenario planning and strategies that is currently going on with the with the government. Comparator with war, uh, the war economy is a productive economy because uh, you manufacture warfare, uh, war, 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 war where, uh, to, to do this. In this particular pandemic, which is like war, there is no manufacturing that is as massive as in war. But when it disappears, the infrastructure that we used to have will still be there, unlike where the infrastructure will have been destroyed by war. So production processes can almost start as quickly as possible. That is why the stimulus itself can land itself in terms of a demand and supply uh, factors may not lead to a hyperinflation because the infrastructure, the productive infrastructure will be there to get things going fairly quickly. And then the demand side will be there. So I doubt if it will be inflation generating to the extent that it is modulated uh, sufficiently to meet the demand side through uh, production. It's only when the production side, the supply side is constrained uh, that uh, the, 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 the financing may lead uh, to a uh, hyperinflation, I, I doubt. And of course, in the uh, modest uh, inflation at the moment across the world, I don't think uh, it can spin out of control, particularly because the productive assets have not been destroyed in a manner like they would have been in war. And then if you look at post-German uh, war, uh, or Germany, the inflation was out of hand. So uh, that, 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 that would be my, my, my considered uh, view on this one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doc. So we only have 10 minutes left, and I would like to thank all our viewers on YouTube. So the room at uh, Zoom was full, so the viewers on YouTube was over 100 also. So we want to thank them, but we also want them to please subscribe to our channel on YouTube. I will give each of the panelists two minutes each because we only have five, uh, 10 minutes left. I'll give each of the panelists two minutes each to, to make a final remark, but I will prompt them to do this remark. Mr. Zungu, please allow me to start with you. There's been questions on set aside. Set aside. There's been question on some small businesses that make their own alcohol and now they're not allowed to sell alcohol. There's been so much questions on lack of swift response and so on. There's also been questions or comments thanking you for the work you guys are doing as BBC. Please, uh, would you mind giving a final response to all this in two minutes? Well, uh, we, 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 we most certainly appreciate um, the positive feedback that we're getting about the work we're doing in, in particular, championing for uh, SMMEs, 
and black business participation. It is our responsibility. Um, and um, in as much as we appreciate um, the accolades, but um, where we're doing wrong, we also want to be encouraged to steer ourselves in the right direction. Um, my closing remarks really are um, <clears throat> the next phase of um, you know, the stimulus as it were, uh, will include reimagining our economy going forward. Um, that's where the biggest fight is gonna be. Uh, if we think we're gonna continue on the same path uh, we're at uh, prior to the COVID-19, then we'll forever slide uh, down to the abyss. Um, then we'll wow the chances that we've had since our democracy. But if we go back to the trenches and reimagine our future, to have SMMEs as at the center of our economic thinking, among others, then I think we'll project ourselves to a new trajectory of growth and a new promise. Um, that's really my um, remarks. And I will add all the people who are players in the SMME space, who are thought leaders in the SMME space uh, and practitioners to encourage us to come up with fresh ideas of how we can reimagine our future with the SMME sector being at the center, such that its contribution towards the GDP is where it is as elsewhere in the world. Thank you, thank you, Sandile. Um, Hanesh, I would like to bring you to this and please also convey our regards to, to the director, Ms. Marie. Um, but two things I want you to consider when you answer Hanesh on these two questions on, on your final responses. What is the impact of COVID-19 on the new kind of startup? Uh, what will be the impact? And then what role do you see 22 on Stone play in institutions like us, not just us? Uh, what role do you see institutions like us playing <clears throat> forward in this new economy? Hanesh? Thank you, uh, Kizito. On your first question, uh, I think there are opportunities for, for startups to, to respond to this crisis. And as, as you are aware, there is an Africa-wide COVID-19 uh, challenge uh, process uh, to, to get startups and entrepreneurs to come up with ideas to fight the crisis and how can, how can uh, governments respond? How can private sector respond? So there's a lot of new ideas, new thinking coming up. And, and I think there are lots of opportunities for, for startups to, to get into this, into this field. Uh, there are immediate challenges. Of course, that there's, they, they face liquidity challenges, just like SMEs. They, they face challenges in accessing uh, you know, uh, networks and resources. But I think they, they, they are also able to benefit from these emerging uh, opportunities. Now, what role can, can 22 on Sloan play? I think the, the fact that you've done this survey, this pulse survey, and you're having this, this conversation, I think it's fantastic. I think this is a time where this, during these extremely challenging times, we need to bring people together, we need to exchange ideas, share information, share resources to find innovative solutions and, and support each other. So I think what you're doing is, is excellent. We in the World Bank would, would be very keen to support a network of, of a startup network platform uh, in South Africa to bring different actors together, you know, from the funding community, from the entrepreneurs, from the service providers, the angels and so on. And we're trying to do this in, in, in a number of countries in the region with the eventual aspiration to set up a Southern Africa regional startup network. And I can see Chuanshu and Sloan playing a huge role in, in that, given that you're already leading these conversations and connecting uh, people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anesh. And, and advocates, Mto, I'm gonna bring you in to, to make your final two minutes comment, but in making those comments, uh, I want you to consider this question. So SMEs, as men they've mentioned the stress and depression that comes with the COVID-19 but no one has really thought about it. And uh, within all these facilities that has been thrown around, is there an opportunity to put in element of emotional support for SMEs? 
and then and then um, what role can you do you uh, your the organization you support uh, you sit on the board see that boosts are play in this regard thank you yes well it's a it, it's a fair request because uh, remember you know previous you might have thought that smes only need financial support but we've never been in a global pandemic such as this which will also require that when you provide support, you must make, make sure that we provide holistic support. And I think it's, some, it's, it's something that is a conversation that we as Saki uh, should be able to take up, you know, working together with other agencies so that we not only focus on one aspect of SME support, but make sure that we support the full complement of the entrepreneurs, because ultimately the heroes of the SME economy, um, uh, ecosystem are the entrepreneurs themselves. And uh, entrepreneurship can be a very lonely road if you don't have proper support mechanisms around you. And as organized business, you know, as we reimagine this economy, I think it also starts talking about what level of support do we provide to our members or our stakeholders beyond the membership, beyond the financial and economic network, but also the humanitarian and the, and, you know, the, the, the entrepreneur being supported um, as we go forward. So it's a conversation that I think we should take forward and it brings up with what I think Sloan, uh, 22 and Sloan should be doing. We've had a chat, you know, you remember Kizito, on how do we bring in a network such as of Psyche to distribute some of the work that 22 and Sloan is doing in Johannesburg and make sure that we really decentralize its location and expand its reach uh, beyond, you know, uh, the traditional spaces uh, where, you know, some of the support may be, but try and see how we can leverage the network of business organizations such as ours to expand the reach of support for SMEs and make sure that we, you know, uh, in the process, unlock new economic opportunities and start new conversations about what, how do we support SMEs, how do we link them to new opportunities, and how does all that activity link to a, a, a national strategy, you know, of economic growth? Because as we are reorganizing ourselves and as we deal with this crisis. We must not deal with SMEs as a, an immediate accidental you know, a, a constituency, but it must be an opportunity for us to properly integrate SMEs into the broader and bigger uh, conversation. Uh, 22 on Sloan, obviously, because of the high level of impact that we've had and the, probably the high level of establishment that you enjoy, I think you also has, have a responsibility to work closely with uh, organized business uh, DFIs, the economic clusters, to strengthen the, econo the, the um, SME uh, ecosystem, making sure that the support that we are providing, you know, is not only looking at SMEs as one set of um, uh, entrepreneurs, but understand the diversity within the SME community and making sure that our relief and our support measures looks at SMEs from the size point of view, from a sector point of view, as well as from an area point of view. And in that way, I think we'll be able to provide support across the board, you know, with learning from the experiences on 22 on, uh, on Sloan. And lastly, we will have to make sure that we focus our energies in sectors where we think we have a competitive advantage or where we have we see greater growth, um, uh, growth opportunities. Because previously, we've also picked up that entrepreneurs because it's such a, a you know a, a lonely road, sometimes entrepreneurs can lock can walk the road by themselves, but actually walking into the wrong direction. We also need to make sure that those of us who are sitting in advantageous position where we understand the global picture of our sectors and where we want to move them, bring entrepreneurs into spaces and sectors that are actually relevant for the economy that we are trying to build and that are relevant for the areas in which they operate. And we don't have a mismatch of Entrepreneurs offering solutions that are no longer relevant for the future of the for the future economy. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Advocate. And then I'll get to Tahir. Tahir, two minutes of your time. As a startup looking at, let's think of disruption. There is now an element of virtual working that will exist post this. There is an element that businesses are forced to diversify their operation. In two minutes, what message? you have for your fellow startups um, in two minutes? So I, I think um, I just like to make mention that uh, I'd like to acknowledge 22 on Sloan. I know that you guys are business as well. 
Um, and my message to 22 on Sloan is continue being a pillar to us. Um, if you guys need a voice to call for help, uh, let us all work together. I think we can assist you with that, 22 on Sloan. Um, Sloan for us is a, is, is a platform uh, for growth and it's also a network for growth opportunities uh, in the sense that uh, when entrepreneurs all get together, even though we are so different and work in different uh, industries, I think great things happen. Um, I think the big message that I'd like to send out uh, to everyone is that uh, if there was ever a time uh, for SMEs, uh, government and corporate to work together to revive the economy, it would be now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tahil. I appreciate that. Then I'll bring in Dr. Pali. Dr. Pali, looking at everything that's been going on, the response from government, from private sector, from public sector, looking at how do we coordinate regional efforts better to support SMEs, looking at consumption production patterns in various parts of the country and ensuring that the economy is open, that SMEs participate integrally and strategically in, in the economy of the country. What is your last two minutes message to everyone watching today? So in that two minutes, share something here. I can share a screen and I hope I'll keep it to two minutes. My God, uh, I thought I had it right now. I, I, yes, it's, it's here. Uh, and uh, I will go into, you see, the, the key thing that we are trying to do as society is to try and increase income per capita. And that income per capita can go through labor productivity, absorption rate, which is employment or terms of trade. In South Africa, even prior to COVID, on labor productivity, we were poor, on absorption rate, we were poor, and on terms of trade, we are not doing any better. And that's a serious problem. So if we were to actually deal with these things in relation to uh, small, medium enterprises, we have to understand a bit of the environment in which they are. For instance, if we look at uh, sectoral cost to income ratios uh, as of 2015 from the um, uh, AFS uh, financial statistics, we see that uh, mining actually has a very high cost to income ratio relative to all these other uh, sectors. And we have to understand how they perform in an organized fashion in a planning fashion. One of the other things that we can look at is what are the sectoral capital generation uh, shares in, in total asset value. And the red here means long-term investments. And this other one means capital uh, formation. And you can see in financial services, long-term investments constitute 52%. And what I'm trying to let us say is there's a lot of important information that should undergird our ability to address small enterprises. But unless we have this kind of systematic approach to how we increase income per capita through labor production, labor productivity, the absorption rate, which is people that get employed in terms of trade, we are less likely to break the back of this problem. So basically in terms of the uh, stimulus, it must be directed in very many ways in structuring, in definitely changing the structure of the ownership of the economy and break down the monopolies and increase uh, the, 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 the ownership of the economy. And coming finally to the district model, we've been talking about the district model a number of times. And uh, the understanding of the district model from how I see people understanding it, is the geographic space that is defined. The district model must be, if it has to be dynamic, an assemblage and an interpretation of an amoeba that keeps on changing shape, depending on the laws of motion of the economy, rather than a fixed space. If we do it that way, then we can actually apply the district model more intelligently, rather than fixed space. Because that notion of fixed space 
constrains how you can use geography as an outcome of processes to influence better economic outcomes than when you look at it as a, a fixed space. I, I thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doc. I really appreciate um, your response. So this brings to an end our, our discussion today. I know there are over 20 questions that I couldn't get through, but I think I selected a few and tried to generalize some of them. So thank you to all the participants on Zoom and all the participants on YouTube that has joined us. And as I mentioned, 22 on Sloan is a startup campus and working with various stakeholders like yourselves who would like to see how do we scale our operations. We've also been affected by COVID-19 and we'll also be looking how do we better our operations? How do we ensure that we keep supporting SMEs and so on going forward? And in ending, I would like to thank all our panelists for making time, but also I would like to thank all our partners, um, uh, Business Leadership South Africa, the USAID and IBM and other partners that has been supporting us as to on Sloan throughout the journey that we've been taking. We thank you. And um, I hope we'll share some results or some article from the from this um, from these discussions. And um, and we thank you. And the, everyone on YouTube, please feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And thank you. And I wish you and your family keep safe and all the best with uh, a health and economic recovery. Thank you. Thank you very much. And finally, thank you to my team also for organizing this and making it possible. Thank you, everyone. Cheers. Uh, Kizu.